Good day and welcome to Of Many Things. I'm Father Matt Malone, Editor-in-Chief of America Magazine. Throughout this series, over the last several weeks, we have been examining these issues that have come to the, the fore of our national debate. Uh, first of all, in the, in the first instance, the epidemic involving uh, COVID-19, and then, of course, the issues of systemic racism that we have been talking about and protesting about and uh, struggling with. Uh, since the death of George Floyd. So this is the next in that continuing series. And I, on this program, and certainly throughout the pages of America, we have been asking ourselves, how do we, how do we respond to these things as, uh, as Christians, um, as Catholic Christians, uh, as citizens of this country, um, uh, also as, uh, as a member of what, whatever group or groups we happen to belong to, um, and of course, you know, how do we respond in such a way that that is open and honest um, and generous? Uh, and one of the one of the things that occurs to me during the uh, during my thinking about this uh, is how do, what what is the role that artists also play in responding to this social and political crisis? Um, and so I thought I would invite my fellow board member from. Uh, the Sheen Center for Art and Culture here in New York, uh, Vanessa Williams, to this program to talk about these things. She is, as you know, um, a huge talent and has been nominated for numerous Emmys and a Tony and Grammys and is the recipient of a number of NAACP Image Awards. And uh, I'm delighted that you could be here today, Vanessa. Thanks. Thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> um, you know, you, you, you've been watching these events unfold over the last few weeks, and I'm sure you see it through, through many lenses as, uh, as a person of color, as an African-American, as a mother, as a Catholic Christian. Um, what's been on, on, on your mind and in your heart about this? Well, honestly, um, uh, I did seek counsel because I was angry uh, and I was confused uh, and, and just frustrated to wit's end. Um, you know, when you watch someone die in front of your eyes, it's something you can't get out of your mind ever. It's etched into your, your soul. And um, when I first, you know, one of my good friends from Broadway, Dulé Hill, um, posted it and I thought, okay, here's yet another example of police brutality. And then as I continue to watch it and I said, there, he's not going to die, is he? And when you actually see the man die in your in front of your your eyes. It was I was nauseated uh, and I was numb for days. Right. And I uh, reached out to one of my 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 friends who's also a um, a priest, Father Edward Beck, and I said I I don't know how to handle this uh, because I am enraged but also sickened to my bones and. Um, actually it was a group of us from Broadway that felt paralyzed. And um, after a week of, of being numb and not knowing what to do, because obviously the status quo was not working, um, we gathered um, Audra McDonald, LaShawn's, uh, Brian Stokes Mitchell, and Norm Lewis, and Capathia, a bunch of black Broadway elders, um, Felicia Rashad, uh, to name a few. And we said, what can we do? And we formed a group called Black Theater United. And uh, we just wanted uh, a collective, an umbrella group that we could um, kind of highlight what, let's highlight one initiative this week. So our first initiative is uh, for fair count, for people to be counted in the census, for black citizens to be counted and heard. So it makes a difference in terms of legislation and schooling and all that stuff. Um, that was, the 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 only way we could find to harness the anger and to actually take action. So that's one uh, aspect that we did collectively as artists. And then personally as an artist, um, I just finished um, shooting uh, my portion of co-hosting a Capital Fourth concert, which I've done for years, which is in, Cal uh, in, in at the Capitol in DC. And um, at first I felt, okay, it's the 4th of July. We're supposed to celebrate our independence and be proud. Uh, that is not the sentiment when everything is on fire and people are angry. 
And I didn't know how to use my voice in order to address that situation. So I talked to um, uh, the, the producers and my team got together with, and, and I, I worked for the Capitol Fourth and Capitol Memorial Day uh, for years. And I said, how can my voice be heard so I can address these issues? We can't ignore them. We can't pretend that nothing's going on and America's all great. And uh, they allowed me to, to write. So uh, I got a chance to look at the script and tailor make it toward what my agenda or what I felt comfortable that needed to be addressed. And I, you know, included inclusion. I included, we will be seen, we will be heard. Uh, I talked about my two great, great grandfathers who uh, was an opportunity to teach, teach America that not only have black Americans been here since the beginning uh, of, of the establishment, but we've made major, major uh, changes. One of my great, great grandfathers uh, born a free man here in New York, in Oyster Bay. Um, and he uh, signed up in Queens, New York for uh, Company I, um, uh, Troop 26, colored troops, to fight uh, in, in, in the Civil War for freedom. So that was one example. And I luckily have a picture of him. So we included that. Oh, wow. in, yeah, we included that in, the, um, uh, in, in my segment. And another was a, another great-great-grandfather who was born a slave uh, in, in outside of Memphis, but his slave masters educated all their slaves. So he ended up not only being literate and reading and writing, was a scoop superintendent of schools and ended up being a representative uh, of Shelby County in the state of, of Tennessee and was one of the first, during the Reconstruction era, one of the first black representatives. So, and I have a picture of him too, which was fantastic. So I got a chance to not only state the fact that we're all aware what's going on, and we need to feel united as Americans. But also the fact that I could give a little history lesson, and that was that made me that made me feel wonderful. Yeah, I, I bet it did. Um, and in, and in, in listening to you speak, it seems to me that that you know that's the kind of journey that we all have to undertake in our own way in our own lives. Is that journey from that that outrage uh, and anger um, and frustration? Um, holding on to the truth of that um, and then translating that into action, right? Like the very question that you asked is what do we, what, what do, we do uh, in light of this? And do you, do you feel that, we, we, that this is a tipping point in this country? That, um, do you feel it's a, that, that, that this event has sort of broken loose something in the conscience of the country? I think that uh, it has definitely propelled us into action in terms of uh, legislation, which is fantastic. Um, you know, I was born in 63, which was the year that Kennedy was killed. My brother was born four years later when Martin Luther King was killed. So my parents dealt with the civil rights era, raising young kids and hoping for a better world. Uh, when I had my kids, when they, uh, back in the, the late 80s, uh, early 90s, um, that's when the Rodney King um, uh, happened and, and all the riots in LA. And I ended up moving back home to New York because I did not want my kids to grow up with that type of fear. And now we find it, you know, 30 some odd years later where my kids are the same age as I was as a young mother. Um, but, you know, when we have legislation that's actually working and changing laws, um, I think that's definitely... Uh, something that's fantastic. And, and it, it is a tipping point. Um, whether it's cyclical, this is our tipping point right now. People have had enough and, um, and, and change is going to be made and, and people are listening. And I have to hand it to, you know, I, I, white people are asking questions. My, all my white friends are like, I love you. What can I do? What can I learn? And um, a lot of my friends um, didn't realize that I had uh, encountered racism the, you know well with your skin color how could anyone call you the n-word and I happened to be uh, they had an emergency meeting in our our local uh, school system here because there's some racial stuff that happened and and of course bubbled up during this whole thing and a lot of the children that I knew growing up uh, who were black in this affluent community had talked about all their racial uh, issues that they had. And, and I called in and, and talked about mine. And, uh, you know, just be, doesn't matter what shade of skin, if you're black, you're black. 
you know, when my parents moved into this community uh, and they were both music educators and had enough money to to buy their house and get their mortgage, of course, there was rumors that they uh, they they didn't have enough. Uh, they wouldn't be able to afford their mortgage. Uh, in third grade was the first time that I got called the N word. And uh, I remember coming home and asking my mom, what does that mean? And 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 she told me and she said, you know, you're going to have to do better than everyone else just to be considered equal. And that's something that I've known since the third grade. And wow. every black person has known that since they've gotten that hard lesson. So a lot of my, my white friends um, were now, now aware that, that now they get it. Yeah. And also yeah. as a mother. I mean, you know, I've got four kids, one son, and you have that talk. You said, no matter how many kids you're out with in a crowd, you're the one black kid, they're going to remember your face. So you've got to be careful. You've got to be respectful, but you also have to be careful. And it must, it, it, it must be a source of deep anger and frustration to even have to have that conversation um, in a way, right? It's a reality. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's one of those, um, you know, it's one of those community things, having black, having black boys. Um, it's, it's that fear factor that they're going to be targeted. And, you know, my father, again, uh, you know, Unfortunately, it's, it is an example of what happened to him. He grew up in Oyster Bay, Long Island, went to um, St. Dominic's. So he went to parochial school till high, till high school. And he went to Oyster Bay High because they had an instrumental program and he wanted to play um, a saxophone. But um, grew up Catholic. We moved up here, went to St. Teresa's. I was, you know, uh, had uh, my, my uh, first communion uh, and, and confirmation here. But sometimes during the sign of peace, when my, my father would reach out and, and want to shake someone's hand, someone would turn around and cross their arms. And my father is a lovely, Catholic, faithful man, and that killed him. That really hurt his heart when he knew that he was doing his best, going to Mass, being a man of faith, and within the community, he was being uh, shunned because of this color of his skin. Is, is there, in your experience as a Catholic, is there a, 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 a you just cited one example, um, you know, the, the church is not immune to these, uh, from these issues and racism has played a part of the history of the Catholic church in this country. Um, are, there, are there specific ways it plays out in the church that you've noticed uh, in your lifetime? Well, there's, uh, we tend to be, black Catholics tend to be a minority in a group of, of, of black, in the black community. Um, and it, actually it's funny when, you know, we can identify each other because you're a black Catholic. Oh yeah. Okay. So, so it's, that, that's a fun uniting, uh, a component, um, uh, that, that unites us. Um, I actually did a movie, uh, called the courage to love, which was about, um, uh, sister Henriette Delil, who was the, um, she was, she started her own order. She basically was, uh, it's, it, we're talking the 1800s. She lived in New Orleans. Uh, she was brought up Catholic and back in the church, there was, there was a slave section. There was a, uh, kind of a mulatto section. And then there was the white section. And she was part of the mixed, uh, octoroons that were part of the society in, in New Orleans, and she was supposed to be married off to, um, you know, a, a wealthy white person. And she said, I don't want to do that. So she wanted to start her own order. And, uh, and she was, you know, serving the poor and, and, and she got blowback from the, uh, the, the, the bishop there saying, you can't start your own order. She made her own habits. Uh, she had her, her group. And um, she actually had a, a few miracles that happened uh, under her, um, during her lifetime. And she's venerated now. We're trying to hopefully get her to, to sainthood. But um, it's a story of someone that says, I, no matter what color I am, I have the, the need to serve. And she ended up, now they have the order of uh, the, the Sisters of the Holy Family. And they're in New Orleans. And it's an example of um, your faith and, and that undying um, uh, fortitude and challenge that you're going to make it work and it worked out for them. So, um, that's, that's my, my, my Catholic female, uh, black woman triumphant story. And, uh, and the nuns, I, every time I go to new Orleans, I visit them. They're fantastic. They have a nursing home. They've got St. Mary's, which is their, uh, 
uh, their high school that, that, that they sponsor. And it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, that, that is amazing. And it seems to me that one of the, one of the resources we can draw on, uh, specifically as Catholics in, in moments like this are, uh, is th those role models and those, uh, those people who have shown us the way. Right. Um, and I think it probably particularly painful for, uh, for, uh, black Catholics that there is a, that this, this instrument of unity, that is a gift of God would be a, would be a place where divisions play out. Um, and yet we also have these amazing resources, these amazing spiritual resources, and we have the amazing stories of these people who, who have come before us and have shown us the way. Um, are there other parts of our, of, of the Catholic tradition that you, that, that you draw on as sources of strength in, in, in times like this or, or, or generally? Uh, the default is love, uh, and forgiveness. That's that, that was what I was really struggling with about three weeks ago when this all happened. Sure. It was really hard to forgive, uh, because the rage was, was here. And, um, so action helped quell that, um, teaching quelled that. And, uh, and I think that watching the world, uh, in multiple races and colors fight for equality and being seen as human beings, that, um, that allows my faith to continue to, to flourish. I mean, I've always been faithful. Yes, it's been, it's been challenged, but um, faith and love, that's, that's, you have to take, take a deep breath and find it because you'll find it. But, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it, it, it will come eventually, right? But yes. yeah, you, you have to take that moment and, and sort of be deliberate about it, right? And, exactly. And, and ask for it, um, mm -hmm. ask for that grace. Um, you know, I, I, I saw you in concert at the Sheen Center last year. Uh, you gave an amazing performance and you, you sang uh, Colors of the Wind, which... Uh, was not a song I was all that familiar with, um, amazingly enough, because it's so been so popular over the years. Uh, but I was re-listening to it uh, over the last couple of weeks in anticipation of talking to you, and it it reminded me of the a lot of these themes from I don't uh, I don't know if you remember this poem by Maya Angelou on the pulse of the morning, which she she recited at the inauguration of Bill Clinton, and there, the themes of these two pieces were so similar, you know, in that. I mean, the, no, the notion that all the world is charged with the grandeur of God and, um, and, and, and has a truth to speak to us. Um, and just it, it reminded me that there is, uh, there's something deeply unnatural about these divisions, right? Mm. And um, while, pre by, while racism, prejudice, and bigotry, they're, they're, they're human conditions, but they're not the way it's supposed to be, right? They're not... Right. They're, they're unnatural in that way. And that, to me, is, a, is, is one of the great claims of, of our faith, which is, you know, we're meant, uh, we're cherished as we are, but we are also meant to be something else, right? That journey yeah. that, um, that you were talking about. Right. Uh, and it's fear. mostly fear-based. Uh, when, when you have fear and, and no knowledge, that's where the ignorance comes in. And you never know what people's stories are. And, you know, unfortunately when all these unfortunate victims are being killed, then you see that they were fathers and devoted sons and, you know, they're human beings that the fear kicked in and that's why people, you know, or the police force in this case react that way, but it's all based in fear. Um, yeah. And there's been some great stories through, through all the craziness on the internet that you see that one particular that protests and one black man uh, put uh, a a, um, a um, I guess he was a neo Nazi or uh, on his shoulder to get him out of harm because he was going to be hurt by the crowd and that was an opportunity for two opposite sides to save each other and appreciate each other so. Uh, I don't have the answers, but I'm glad. Uh, I, I'm glad things are 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 changing, and people are again woke. We've heard this, but people are awake. People are awake and listening. And and I think the point you make, which is which is so important, is it, it, it has to be. It has to. It has to at least begin with, with honest reflection and conversation. Uh, you know, I, I wrote a piece for America last week, in, in which uh, which was addressed to my white neighbors. 
and and saying, you know, look, this is a part of our experience, and we all know it, and um, we're not always honest with each other. And I talked about, you know, my own grandmother, whom I love, but was also she was also a racist, and mm -hmm. consciously so, mm -hmm. and and it was that fear that drove her, um, you know, her her whole life, and. The number of people who've come up to me in the last week or so and said, you know, something like that happened to my family or something like that happened to me. And um, and I, I just think th this is the stuff that we got to be wrestling with. Right. As painful as it is, as hard as it is. And uh, and we certainly know from our own tradition that Good Friday is not the end. Right. It, it, mm -hmm. it does end in Easter Sunday, a place of hope. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I also know that, uh, you know, you share a love of the Sheen Center here in New York. Uh, yes. The Sheen Center for Thought and Culture, which is a work of the Archdiocese. It's a place for the performing arts and also for intellectual discussion and reflection. Um, like everything, everywhere, they, they've been shut down to in-person uh, events, but they've had a ton of programming over the last uh, a few weeks about, about this issue, about living in, in, in a time of pandemic um, and so forth. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to ask you what it was that attracted you to the work of the Sheen Center. I was first introduced to the Sheen Center. Uh, Father Edward Beck was doing a series uh, of um, chats with music. So it was myself and Kelly O'Hara and uh, uh, um, uh, some, some other performers. And basically we'd sit down and talk about our faith, but also get up and sing some songs that were pertinent to where we were at the time of the conversation. Uh, and that's, uh, Bill was our, um, was our director uh, at the time. And he's the one that said, listen, I'd love for you to, to join the board. And um, that's how I got turned on to the, the Sheen Center. It's a jewel uh, in the village. Um, a lot of people don't even realize it's there. Beautiful theater. They've got a black box downstairs, which a black box theater. Um, they've got studios and, and art shows, uh, not only performances, but these wonderful conversations that are sometimes political, sometimes not, sometimes a journey of someone's, you know, a, an author, a filmmaker. It's really uh, a special place that, uh, and it's, it's multicultural as well. And our board also reflects that, which is, which is also great. We've got a, a wonderful rabbi, we've got a minister, it, uh, it, it's it's a it's a place of inclusion, um, but also uh, an opportunity to really check in and and see what you might like. Yeah, well, it's it. What I love about the place uh, too is um, that that sense of this is a place where the human being can be fully alive, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to draw upon every part of our tradition, every place where we find something that's good and true and beautiful. Uh, we're going to. We're going to celebrate it, or uh, we're going to talk about uh, whatever is involved, whether it's 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 painful or it's consoling. Um, it's a really terrific place where uh, uh, that and and a, also a fantastic showcase for amazing talent. I mean, yes. the, the programming that's gone through there, um, right? Over, yeah, just just in its first couple of years. Yeah. Um, yeah. Vanessa, thank you. Thank you really very much for being with us. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at the Sheen Center and uh, yes. watching you on uh, Capitol 4th. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks for your program and your voice. And um, it, it's, uh, it's wonderful to, to have hope and faith and, uh, and change and, and blue skies. I mean, we're, we're heading to um, a, a better place. I believe it is a tipping point. I believe things uh, will get better and they are getting better. So thank you for uh, your leadership as well. Oh, well, thank you. And, uh, you know, I couldn't, uh, couldn't be more, more proud to serve with you on, on the Sheen Center and, and, and to walk with you as a fellow Catholic. Thank so you. Uh, th thank you very much, Vanessa. All God right. Bless. Have a great day. You too. Uh, what an amazing conversation. And, um, that, that article that I, I mentioned in our conversation uh, is called An Open Letter to My Fellow White Americans. And uh, that was, you know, my modest attempt as a, as a white guy um, who's lived that experience in this country to talk about how I came to have some consciousness. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not omniscient 
<laughs> but only God is that. But to have some consciousness about how racism has played a part in my own life and in my own story, um, in not that I've been discriminated against, but I, as a white person, I've enjoyed that that privilege, that uh, that word that we've heard a lot about over the last few weeks. Um, that in a sense, I've I have been judged by the color of my skin, but it's actually it's actually helped me, you know. And I talked about some of those instances. Uh, of encountering that dynamic. And it, just in the interest of starting a conversation, especially with my fellow white Americans, um, because I just think it's, we, we might think that we're always talking about race, but we're not really. We're not talking about it in, in an honest way and in a candid way uh, with a kind of candor that hurts. Um, and that's really important. There was a, another piece uh, that came out this uh, week at America. Um, and it was uh, uh, a reflection. Uh, actually, this came out two weeks ago. It was a reflection by uh, Mario Powell, who is a Jesuit from Brooklyn, and he is the head of uh, Brooklyn Jesuit Prep. And uh, I'm just looking it up here real quick. Um, I don't know because I want to direct you to it. It is a uh, it's an it's an amazing reflection. Speaking as a as an African American man. Uh, as a Catholic Christian, as a Jesuit, about his own experience and um, what we need to hear uh, as white folks and as fellow Christians about that experience in order to know how to respond. Um, and I also wanted to bring to your attention one other piece that we had in the course of this conversation. Uh, if I can find it here. <laughs> um, uh, and I, yes, there it is. It was, uh, the Supreme court case, which, uh, just came out this week. There've been a number of them and we've had a lot of commentary on it at America. Uh, but particularly this case yesterday about, uh, DACA and the so-called dreamers and how the Supreme court, um, you know, gave a, a reprieve to that program. Um, you know, the editors of America weighed in on it. We've had some voices in our pages uh, talking about it in these days. Um, but also another crucially important issue, you know, because there's something that links how we approach uh, immigration and then and how we approach policing. And and what links them is um, this fear that Vanessa talked about, this fear of the other, this fear of of diversity uh, and of change. And, uh, you know, whatever public policy takes shape uh, to reform both the immigration system and our policing system, we have to confront that fear. Um, and as I said in our conversation, it's, it's an unnatural. Uh, division is unnatural. It's a consequence of our own choices and of our sin. Uh, but it is not what God intended for us. And, uh, and it's certainly not what he calls us to, which is something else entirely. You can find the Sheen Center at sheencenter.org. It's located here in New York. It's a really terrific resource. Uh, be sure to watch Vanessa Williams on uh, the Capitol 4th. And, uh, and be sure to check out all the other content at America. Uh, it's at americamagazine.org. You can follow us on social media. And you can also follow us on our YouTube page, where you'll get continuing updates about, uh, well, the, the episodes in this series, but also all of the other programming that we are doing uh, in video and in audio, uh, which you can access on that platform. Thank you very much for watching today. Uh, God bless you. Have a good weekend.